Hi, I'm Meg. Welcome to Plant Fit Meg. Welcome back to the channel. I'm thrilled today to have a really exciting guest on the channel. Visanto Molina is here to talk plant-based protein with us. She has her new book, Plant Powered Protein, out that she co-authored with Brenda Davis and Corey Davis. And if you're unfamiliar with Visanto Molina, I'm sure many of you know who she is and are familiar <laughs> with her work. But just in case you're unfamiliar, I'll get into her bio and what she is all about and all the amazing work that she has done. So Visanto is an amazing plant-based dietitian, a nutrition consultant, an academic instructor, and a sought-after speaker at conferences worldwide. She's the lead offer, uh, lead author rather, of the last physician paper on vegetarian diets for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She has co-authored 14 books. 14. Amazing. Including nine with her writing partner, Brenda Davis. Together, they've written plant-based nutrition classics such as Becoming Vegan, the Comprehensive Edition, and the Express Edition. And as I mentioned, her latest is plant Barred Protein, an amazing resource for anyone curious about protein, wondering about it, and wanting to get into a plant-based diet. So hello, Vicento, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Meg. Yeah, Thanks. It's a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you and chat about how people can get plant-based protein into their lives and make it work and keep it simple and be successful on a plant-based diet. That's right. Yeah. I, we weren't going to do a book about plant protein. Our publisher oh, okay. asked us to, and we oh, said, oh, we don't need to do that because you easily get enough protein on a plant-based diet. Yeah, and he said, well, that's what people ask about all the time. And I think he was right, because our book has actually shot to number one on Amazon in the sustainability category. That's and amazing. Very high in the health categories. And it's, it's really impressive. So it was yeah. like the right thing at the right time. That's yeah. fabulous. Congratulations. And Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you sort of what inspired the book, but that's, that's a wonderful answer to that question before I even asked it that, you know, people are kind of clamoring for this information and wanted that resource and that guide and the numbers are showing that that's true. That's right. And when we got into it, we found it was really fascinating. Like, yeah, through it all it was really, really fun. Yeah, that's what I love that everything's science based and evidence based. And it's not just kind of guessing or throwing things around. It's, it's scientific. And it's um, a great resource that way. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And keeping it simple for people too. It's not too wordy or too um, complex either. Oh, that's what I like. Because I yeah. we do the research in a lot of depth. And mm -hmm. our um, references, the website's plantpoweredprotein.com with a dash between plant plant and powered mm -hmm. and we also have a references page right so our, our publisher wanted us to keep the book slim yeah but um i like to keep things simple i'm kind of a johnny cash kind of person for writing and uh, so i like to have like one and two syllable words that keep it yeah. simple and then my co-authors brenda and corey are much more long words and complex. And we we actually end up with quite a nice mix of blend of these yeah. different, uh, you know, it, because even health professionals, even doctors who use our books quite a mm -hmm. lot, like to have it simple. You know, they like to have it just straightforward. And here's for sure. Yeah. yeah, it keeps it nice and easy and kind of a light, easier read. And then also to relay the information to other people, if other people are sort of questioning you or in, in case, the case of healthcare providers, if they're relaying information to patients and um, clients and things like that, then it makes it easier to kind of just take the information and relay it just as it is rather than having to have something really scientific and then sort of trying to break it down. It's already broken down for them. So that's yeah, great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I also, I always like to ask people sort of how they get started eating a plant-based diet and how long have you been vegan? Okay. Well, my plant-based, my vegetarian origin was from India. Oh, cool. So I, I'm actually quite old. I'm 81. <laughs> 81, and, yay! Yeah, 81. Awesome, I <laughs> love it. You know, I'm wanting to help people get old and be in good health in these, yes. these years. Um, but when I was in India, I found that the culture was very, very supportive to going plant-based. Mm -hmm. And um, it was 
was just so interesting to learn to be vegetarian in a culture that was used to that. So um, when I came back from India, I spent four years there, actually. And oh, wow. I learned a lot, traveled. I just had a really interesting time. And I had been teaching university before. So going to India was kind of learning about the other side of the world and culture. And uh, I, I uh, started doing courses through the University of British Columbia, where I had been teaching on the faculty sometimes, and to the public, and then to dietitians just about how to do this. And that led to our first book. And then when I was writing our first book, which was called Becoming Vegetarian, I did a chapter called Without Dairy, because of course, India's vegetarian does include ghee and, and, uh, you know, different cheeses that yeah, are, of course. Yeah. And, and when I wrote this chapter called Without Dairy, I thought, oh, I could do that. And so yeah. I did it. Nice. And that, that was 30 years ago. So the first, first instance for vegetarian was 45 years ago. Wow. And vegan was 30 years ago. And uh, then, so I'd started because of culture, not mm -hmm. because of the usual reasons that people go plant-based. And then I started learning about the animal issues, um, right. like boar bashing, where they smash pigs on the snout to get into their truck to go to the slaughterhouse, which they are not inclined to want to do. Yeah. And that really was troubling to me. And then I started learning more about all the health reasons which are mounting and mounting and mounting to go more plant-based. And then in more recent times, we're learning about the environmental reasons, which are bringing a lot of men on board. So mm -hmm. it's just been a growing uh, incidence of these um, reasons and backup for choosing more plant-based. Yeah, so many reasons, right? You start with one thing and then you kind of start to peel the onion and find these different layers and different reasons for doing it. And that's amazing that you've been vegetarian for 45 years and vegan for 30 and that's obviously right. thriving and still working and that's doing right. all these amazing things. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it is fun. Yeah, this yeah. year I'll be speaking in, uh, I think, Philadelphia at the Vegan Society, Manhattan to all the New York school staff. Oh, nice. And then in New Jersey, and then we'll go to Brazil. Wow, lots of big yeah. plans. L That's lots amazing. of, you know, people are interested in this topic all over the world, yeah. all ages, all just all sorts of people. Yeah, that's so exciting. I love that. I was going to ask you about the inspiration for the book, but you already sort of mentioned that, you know, your your publisher actually said, hey, like, we keep getting these questions, and this would be a good, <laughs> a good thing to write about. It's something people want to know. Um, I think sometimes when people talk about protein, they don't even necessarily know what it is or why it's important. It's just kind of been drilled into us that, you know, eat meat, meat is protein, eat it, it's healthy for you, it'll make you grow big and strong. But let's kind of break it down for people. What is protein and why is it important for us? Okay, well, we have these macronutrients that provide calories, and these include carbohydrate, which is a very good thing to have when it's complex carbohydrate. Of course, carbs get bad rap because 90% yeah. 90, 90 of what people eat are the very refined, like the sugar and the white flour and so on. But carbs are very valuable and they actually keep our brain running. But they're just simple little molecules. And then there's fat. And we do have essential fats um, that can drive on a lot of calories. And then the complex, really complex molecules are the protein. And they're long chains of amino acids. and all convoluted and they're in a certain shape and they um, they do jobs related to their shape and their length and exactly what amino acids are in this mix. So protein are quite a separate category and mm -hmm. we certainly require them. We do require them for muscle building and they're an important part of bone. Like bone has a protein matrix with minerals in it. And then we need it for enzymes, for antibodies for certain vitamins. Uh, but it's just um, used in so many different ways to protect us, to build us, to communicate. There's transfer proteins that and that could send messages. And, and uh, so um, it's, it's uh, a, a great list of the different proteins that we have. And we need to build everyone exactly. So of course, we need the amino acids. Yeah, all the building blocks of the proteins, right? 
That's right. Yeah. And then people wonder, you're probably going to ask this one, <laughs> you get all the amino acids from plants. Yeah, that's a big, big question big for a question. lot of people. Yeah. And it turns out that every one of the amino acids is actually from plants. Like when Amazing. You, um, yeah. we, if you were uh, looking at what amino acids are in beef, that cow ate plants and that's how it got the amino acids every right. one of them every single essential amino acid that we yeah. require so um it turns out that we can get every amino acid that we need which is amazing and wonderful information that people need to hear because so often if you tell someone you're vegan or you're eating a plant-based diet one of the first questions you get is well where do you get your protein right and that's there's right. just this huge misconception that protein is just from meat and just from eating animal products. Um, it seemed protein seems to be the one macronutrient that's really emphasized and prioritized and uh, it's marketed heavily. Why do you think that that is? Well, we, we've, we've had a history of um, in the depression, of course, people hardly got enough food and there was a glorification of meat a chicken in every pot, that was something really sought after because people were struggling so much just to get the foods they needed. And then we had some interesting research in about the 1950s. And I've been around for a long time looking at research. And I remember all these rat studies that were done. And they would give a weanling rat that's four months so four weeks old. Mm -hmm. different foods and see what they thrived on it only give it one food so it wasn't the way people actually eat and they did better on cheese and meat so they want they doubled their weight in four weeks and they gr could grow fur all over their body Which now is people, wonderful for the rat <laughs> what about exactly. humans <laughs> humans want to double their weight in four weeks well I haven't met no. any that did, but, and they don't want to grow fur all over their body, which takes certain sulfur amino acids. Mm -hmm. And so we got this misconception because we were doing rat studies. And we actually have struggled to translate that into human studies. In fact, some of those um, protein efficiency ratio concepts are still used in, in Canada as ways of assessing protein quality, which we should be way beyond that. But we really have trouble uh, with how to assess protein quality. Now, we're right. gradually evolving, but our scientific measure that are the standards haven't quite caught up because we don't have a perfect one yet. But yeah. we do have some where you measure what protein goes in and be when you can check what is coming through the intestine, just at, at a certain stage in the intestine, um, you can see how much was absorbed. And uh, so that type of protein, we only have limited data on it, but it's showing that uh, plant protein is doing just fine when it comes to supplying everything. We absorb it well, we get the nutrients and so on. Yeah, that's great. And that's wonderful information for people because um, I do still hear from time to time people talking about protein quality and maybe that animal protein is of a higher quality and is better absorbed and plant protein is maybe of a lower quality and not as good. Um, so can you kind of speak further to that and where that comes from yeah. and if that's accurate or not? And, and it's lucky because I've evolved through all these different stages. And I remember in the early 70s when Frances Moore LePay wrote Diet for a Small Planet. And she had the idea, if you ate beans and grains, and beans were a bit long on this amino acid, and grains were a bit long on this other amino acid, but short on the one that that you have this perfect combination. And then people right. scrambled around seeing how much chickpeas they should have with their brown rice. Then after 10 years, Francis Moore LePay said, oops, we didn't really have to do it. <laughs> we didn't have yeah. to get our slide rules and our calculators and use. We, we find that with just a mix of plant foods, we are doing fine. You get 
And every plant food has all the amino acids. Mm -hmm. Um, They have them in slightly different proportions. But if you get a mix, as you should on your food guide, like we're not like the rat that only gets plumped down with one thing and that's it. Um, But if you get a mix of foods, you're just doing fine for protein. So we don't actually find protein deficiency among Mm -hmm. plant eaters or in, in North America, really. Yeah. Unless people are very short for calories, like if they're anorexic or something. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between animal and plant plant protein then if people are sort of concerned about making the switch or have just kind of started into a plant-based diet? Is there a big difference? Does our body know the difference? Is it, is there a big difference between the protein that comes from animals versus the protein that comes from plants? And are there other factors, you know, other nutrients or other, um, other macros or other things that are in those items in animal foods or plant foods that are beneficial or detrimental? Well, the, uh, when you absorb a protein, you break it down into the amino acids. And Mm -hmm. then when they're absorbed, your body has no idea whether this amino acid had come originally from a plant, but via a cow's flesh. Right. Or if it had come directly from the plant, it's just the same amino acid. So Mm -hmm. that is no different at all. Now, that's about the protein, but the protein foods come packaged quite differently. So meat itself has a lot of components. We used to think of saturated fat as being a harmful thing for heart disease, which is is still true and for type 2 diabetes and so on. But we're finding there are components like TMAO uh, that is produced um, when we eat the meat-based diet and doesn't happen when we're eating the plant protein foods. Um, And that's linked with cardiovascular disease. There's new 5G, a component that's linked with cancer that's in meat, not in plant foods at all. So there are quite big differences in the actual foods and what they deliver. Right. So it's not necessarily about the protein or the protein quality itself, because those are just broken down into the amino acids in your body, but it's just sort of the packaging of what else it's coming along with. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds good. So we often hear in the plant-based community that as long as you're eating sufficient calories, you'll be getting enough protein and as long as you're eating a varied diet, you're good to go. You sort of touched on that a little bit. Is that an accurate statement? Um, Well, you could eat pop and potato chips. True. (laughs) That's vegan food. True. (laughs) I haven't met anybody that's doing that. Yeah. You know, but you could, you could do that and be vegan. Um, It turns out that most people on plant-based diets are trying to sort it out you know, and get get a good balance. Mm -hmm. And by the way, on our plantpoweredprotein.com website, we do have a food guide link on there. And so people can look and see what's the good balance of like vegetables, fruits, um, grains, uh, nuts and seeds, and then the real high protein delivers the legumes, the beans, peas, lentils, peanut butter, tofu, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have a kind of balance. And Canada's food guide is actually very close to this guide. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. I was so excited to see the new guide when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it was very different from, you know, the previous iteration and emphasized plant foods even more. So that was really exciting to see. It sure did. I mean, yeah. scientists are just recognizing this. And our, our government bodies have been very influenced by the um animal products industries. I mean, Mm -hmm. they wanted, you know, farmers wanted to keep working, they wanted to keep making money and so on. And so we've heavily subsidized these foods. Um, I think burgers would be about $30 a pound. Wow. All the subsidies by some of the calculations that are out there, Mm -hmm. they'd certainly be a lot more expensive if we didn't have the subsidies and dairy is very subsidized. So it's kind of unfortunate and I hope we'll be shifting in a different direction so that we'd be subsidizing if we were going to subsidize foods plant foods organic foods this kind of thing that are really supporting health but um we're we're moving along and, and health Canada has actually been making a good transition 
Yeah, it'd be great if we could incentivize those dairy farmers and those uh, people in those industries to kind of make shifts over to plant-based productions or to uh, make changes. But I'm sure that's much easier said than done and well, very in fact, uh, optimistic. <laughs> no, it, in the United States, half of the dairy farmers have gone out of business. Right. Half. And... Um, this there's been Miyoko's, you know, who makes the cashew cheeses. Yeah, she has been working in that area to help those farmers earn a livelihood growing plant foods because they have the land, they have some of the resources, the interest. That's and amazing. So there weren't less cows because they all have got ended up in the factory farms, which just got bigger, 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 huger. Right. Um, but and uh, they're the ones getting the subsidies, of course. These big factory farms. But um, the, the uh, evolution is happening in, in Canada, too. You know, farm, small farms are, are struggling. Yeah. And, um, so uh, it is good that we're shifting and, and people are shifting over to different kinds of production. But yeah. Yeah. Things are changing for sure. And, you know, it takes time for things to make those changes and those shifts and those evolutions. But uh, we are seeing it happen, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So with protein, is it possible to get too much protein? We kind of addressed not getting enough, but is it possible to overdo it and just eat too much protein that would create problems for people? It It is. And we're, we're finding it with uh, meat eating populations. It mm. can be hard on your kidneys. Mm. Um, the kidneys, we need a certain amount of protein and that's easily accomplished plant foods or animal products. Now, if you get too much, your body can use the protein for carbohydrates, which are very essential for running your brain. You need at least 150 grams a day of carbohydrates. And so it can lop off the nitrogen group and convert the amino acids and convert the protein into that would be fuel for your brain and, and for energy use. Mm -hmm. But that is work. And, and the kidneys can struggle at that point. So right. we find that some meat eaters are eating too much protein and that causes problems. Now, when we're talking about an elite athlete, uh, they are um, using more protein, maybe to build muscle or something like that, but it doesn't run into problems with the plant protein area. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Do we need to track our protein intake to ensure that we're getting enough and that we're not overdoing it? Or do you think that there's sort of a, a different way of doing that? Like, do people need to use tracking apps and things? Do you recommend that? Or do you recommend sort of a different method and way of doing that? Well, um, I do consultations with people. My website's nutrispeak dot com mm -hmm. and look at the consultations area and what i do is a nutritional analysis using a program called uh, the food processor by esha and it's it's a rather complex and it keeps updated and i find that it keeps a very good record of exactly what people are eating so sometimes if they're interested you know um i've had a few clients that were almost orthorexic like they tried oh, to be wow. so perfect um that they could be borderline mm -hmm. in certain nutrients um and so we can track that kind of thing now um i haven't found too little protein except with people who are on kind of fruitarian raw food diets right because of all the food groups fruit is the one that's less than 10 percent calories from protein Mm -hmm. And the other food groups, um, you know, even lettuce, like if you ate a wheelbarrow full of <laughs> protein, you know, yeah. and, uh, you, you get protein from uh, grains. Half the world's protein comes from grains. You know, if you get a Sherpa car carrying your pack in Nepal, um, they'll be eating millet or rice. They'll have a little bit of lentils sometimes. But um, so that's a very important source. But the nuts and seeds are, are helpful for some people and they provide other nutrients. And then the legumes, the beans, peas, lentils, they provide significant amounts of protein. So I find sometimes I need to help people figure out, okay, how do you actually get beans into your diet? Maybe you had some right. horrible 
dish that you made as a child you yeah. didn't like. And you think, oh, I don't like beans, but there are actually 20 kinds of beans. And there's all the soy foods and all kinds of things. And if people uh, explore a bit and explore the cultures of the world, they'll find some that are absolutely yummy. For sure. Yeah. And I think sometimes the texture of beans can kind of throw people off. So maybe starting people with lentils or just other options, you know, tofu or soy milk, like other things that can be providing those, that protein source and the, the nutrient nutrient source, but um, maybe, okay. yeah, there we go. <laughs> this is a lovely. hurry in a hurry. Uh, beautiful. Diabetes book. And yeah. uh, this is an interesting book too, Beyond Our Plant Protein one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's uh, even for people who don't have diabetes, um, these are foods that have no added oil and no added sugar. Mm -hmm. So they're they're um, good for weight management, which I know some people who are listening to your podcasts are interested in keeping their weight, you know, keeping slim and yeah, absolutely. Strong too. So um, I've really been interested in keeping it simple mm -hmm. while you get enough protein. Yeah. So in terms of how much people, how much protein people actually need, how much does the average adult actually require in a day? And what does that sort of look like if you break it down into like what your plate might look like or what a day of eating might look like? Okay. Well, I uh, find that it's good to try and have something like legumes, beans, peas, lentils. This might be astounding. <laughs> Three times a day. Three times a day. Nice. That does not mean a big bowl of beans. Right. <laughs> lunch and supper. What it could be, and this is what my husband has, is peanut butter on your toast. Right. He loves that. And that's so simple. simple. That's the easiest thing you can do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or you could have soy milk in nice. your, yeah. um, whatever you have, cereal or granola or something like that, or mm -hmm. in some coffee, you know, just in a, a mix of things. But that those are both legume type foods and then for lunch you could have a bean salad I've actually got some here that's from our just having had some of this yeah um, <laughs> oh you're salad. spelling it <laughs> yeah right oh that's okay and uh also um another thing to have is um this is a a quinoa salad Ooh. Yeah. And, and quinoa is a grain that's actually quite high in protein. So um, with quinoa, it, one of the favorite things there is that it cooks in 15 minutes. Really yeah, fast. which is nice. So yeah. do the red lentils. So this can be just as easy as anything. Mm -hmm. And with quinoa, you can add a little bit of lime juice, perhaps some toasted sesame oil, salt and pepper, maybe herbs and then some cut up veggies if you want to make it pretty. And uh, that could be very simple. The multicolored bean salad that we have that I showed you, um, it's in our Plant Powered Protein book too. Mm -hmm. um, it's one that I keep a lot because especially, for example, in the summer, you can just make a big bowl of it. And it's so easy. You just open three cans of beans or two yeah. cans of beans. You could even have one and uh, add some colored veggies. You could see the red pepper, some corn from a can. Like it can just be really easy. Perhaps some frozen green beans, mm -hmm. a little bit of a dressing. And we tend not to use such oil-based dressings, maybe a bit of toasted sesame oil, but just some lime juice, some salt, pepper, some herbs, and it it is just sitting there. Yeah, it's That's just ready I, for you. It's waiting ready. for you to eat. <laughs> All the time. And the other thing that I like to eat is um, a salad. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just lettuce. We actually grow it in our um, rooftop greenhouse. Oh, that's um, great. And uh, I call it five-day salad because... If you don't put in things like tomatoes and red pepper, it really will last for five days when you've got romaine and you could have some other greens in it. You could have a bit of red cabbage for color. And so that can be ready. If you've got a little container like Tupperware or something, you know, that will sit in the fridge, um, it'll be ready in an instant. You walk in the door, you're starving and it's just ready. And mm -hmm. the types of dressings that we use, 
This is also from our plant powered protein book. This is a lemon tahini dressing, has no oil in it, but the fat that's there is tahini and it delivers calcium. So it's a good bone strengthener. So yeah. that can be a simple, so a meal could be, I, I like to have ones that have definitely some legumes, lots of salad, lettuce, that kind of thing, a dressing that delivers nutrients, not just oil and sugar, like some mm -hmm. of the, and then um, grains are kind of optional. People that are really wanting to limit their calories can go low on the grains. Um, you will get some carbohydrates from the beans, uh, but that's the one to cut back on. Or if you're an athlete or you're high energy person, you might have lots of things like the quinoa or rice or potatoes or something like that. So the meal kind of has like three components, the beans, the salad -y stuff um, with the dressing and the grains. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And I love how you gave so many tips for keeping it simple and really accessible for people and just keeping it easy. Because I think a lot of times, especially people who are just starting out with a plant based diet, they're like, I don't even know what to eat. Like what, if meat isn't the center of my plate anymore? What do That's I do? Right. And how do I prepare it? And how do I make it delicious? Right? So I love that um, the, the books provide so many lovely recipes, and then you giving some uh, great tips there for keeping it really simple and just really easy. I really, uh, that's really great. Some menus in there, by the way. Yeah. Also show through the day and give people reassurance. Yeah, you're getting protein here. Look at you're fine. You yeah. Get, here, you're fine. You get protein here, you're fine. Yeah. And for someone who's a little more maybe um, concerned about their protein intake or um, that they're getting the nutrients they need, maybe following something like that as a guide for a little while just to kind of get used to eating a plant based diet if you're just starting out or if maybe you've been into the junk food yeah, vegan yeah, situation true. for a while and you want to shift gears and get into a healthier place that can be a good way to start and a good resource for just knowing that you're getting the nutrients you need and getting um, enough protein and everything what are the highest sources of plant protein if someone is looking at um, really increasing their protein intake what are the sort of best sources or highest plant-based uh, sources of protein so in among the legumes, and I mentioned there's 20 kinds of legumes. Mm -hmm. How many can you think of? Oh, well, this is putting you on the spot. How many can I think of? Oh my yeah, goodness. beans, peas. Beans, black yeah. beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, lupin beans, fava beans. Uh, uh, what else is there? Great. There's lentils. There's red lentils, green lentils. <laughs> what else do I eat? There's so many different kinds. There's, there's, there's so just many. all kinds of colors. And, and you just check out the aisle and it's just, it's a plethora of options. And if you think about different cultures in yes. Asia, they often have red beans. In right. Mexico, they have pinto beans, the Spanish. Yes, so they're, they're different cultures. And of course, in Vancouver, which is like Vegcouver, yeah, <laughs> restaurants, um, mm -hmm. people can look at happycow.net website. Yes. And great resource. Just find all kinds of ethnic restaurants that will introduce you to different different ones um and let's see oh yeah that another oh let's among those peanut butter is a handy and we don't think of that but legumes are things that grow in pods mm -hmm. yeah they're like lentils are little funny things they look like peas in a pod yeah. when they're growing on the plant we don't ever get we don't see that, that part yeah no <laughs> but they all do and then another one now this is the real heavy hitter are the soy foods yes which unfortunately got a bad reputation an un un undeserved bad reputation mm -hmm. early on about 15 years ago and they're a wonderful source of protein and very versatile, very, very versatile. Yeah. And so what about people's fear around soy and about phytoestrogens and men being kind of afraid of man boobs or being feminized in some way? Is there any <laughs> truth to any of that? Can you dispel that myth and give yeah. us the, the real facts here about all of that? Okay, well, about, uh, oh, gosh, it was maybe 20 years ago, there were two men in totally different places that ate, one of them ate 12 servings of soy a day, and one ate 20 oh my servings goodness. of soy a day, which they must have had like free 
soy milk and mm-hmm. wheat tofu or something that they could eat infinite amounts. Yeah. And, or if they thought I wanted to get strong, there were different ages too, 19 and 60. Oh, and man. after a year, they did develop man boobs. But you shouldn't be eating 12 or 20 servings of any single food, like carrots. Exactly. Or, you know, it just doesn't work. That's a problem. <laughs> yeah, the problem, like the poor old rat got a delivered one thing, but we shouldn't be. So um, yeah. anyway, at the end of a year, they went to their doctors and their doctors independently said, you should not be eating this way. The doctors fortunately figured that out pretty quickly. And sure. so they went back to having normal, not man boobs. Yeah. Um, they turned <laughs> into a normal diet. Now, those rumors were propagated by Weston Price, by the meat industry, to make us think that soy was bad, but it right. isn't actually. And then we had questions because there are isoflavones in soy, which are kind of like estrogen. And we thought, gee, maybe those are affecting our hormones. But it turns out they're sufficiently different from estrogen, the isoflavones, that they can't do the job that estrogen does of actually promoting cancer in later life. And they actually block some of the estrogen from being absorbed and used. Mm -hmm. So they get in the way. And so it's actually turned out, rather than being a disadvantage in terms of breast cancer and prostate cancer, to be an advantage. When kids get soy foods when they're little, they turn out to have less breast cancer and less prostate cancer when they're old. Mm -hmm. And also, if people have breast cancer, it lessens the likelihood of, and they're trying to reverse it, they're in better health when they do include some soy at that point, and for men, prostate. So these are some quite recent studies that have been done. And so we find that soy is actually an advantage overall. Now, it's um, it's particularly high in protein, but if people are allergic to soy, you know, it's one of the big hitters for allergies, as are dairy and eggs, of course, and fish. Mm-hmm. We eat lots of foods, but it's in with the top eight. Um, it's okay to use any of the other legumes, like lentils. Yeah. yeah. Now, we also can get a, um, a fair amount of protein from hemp seeds and some of the seeds, um, pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds. These are all pretty- yeah, I think sometimes people forget about seeds. They're very focused on like the beans and the soy products and seeds kind of just end up forgotten about, I think. But yeah, hemp seeds are wonderful. And I'm sure there are other seeds that pack a punch as well. That's right. The, yeah, the, the pumpkin seeds turned out to be mm. pretty good. And I'm, I'm glad they're starting to make some cheeses out of the seeds because yeah. they're grown. They're not so much uh, water users as some of the nuts are. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, but um, they can make really good cheeses. So our our technology is evolving to do some pretty nice products. And it's not actually the milk that makes a cheese. It's the fermentation. So if you start out with a plant based um, substrate and then inoculate that with the as they do with the milk and to make cheese, but you can end up with some really good cheeses. Yeah, that's really interesting. I haven't. I don't think I've really tried cheeses made out of seeds before. So that'll well, there, be that's a, a whole new adventure. <laughs> just one made in Ontario. Um, oh, nice! That, that is turning out to be quite good. It's quite yeah. successful. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about athletes. So, how do protein requirements vary from sort of the average adult to someone who's you know an, engaged in athletic pursuits or a professional athlete? Okay, well, for uh, people, our official recommendation is 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. Mm -hmm. And that's actually per kilogram healthy body weight. So if somebody was way overweight, they wouldn't need 0.8 grams per kilogram of their actual weight, but of their what they think their weight should be, if they were having an optimal weight. And then when we go more plant-based, we suggest a slight increase to 0.9 grams per kilogram. Um, And then for athletes who are actually building muscle, we Mm -hmm. suggest higher amounts, of course, like um, 1.2 or 1.5 grams, just depending. And that's where they're actually adding muscle. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, if somebody's just going out and doing exercise on the weekend, you know, doing hiking and um, going to fitness classes during the week, that kind of thing, you don't need higher amounts of protein. That okay. just helps you, um, you know, re- retain your muscle mass and, and keep it strong. And you don't need these higher amounts. Mm-hmm. But athletes could need higher amounts. Right. And particularly if someone's trying to build muscle. That's right. That's While goal. you're actually adding it. Yeah. Now, if somebody's a gymnast, they want to have strong muscles in the beginning, but they're not wanting to bulk up the way a bodybuilder True. is. True. Yeah. So it'll, things will very shift and vary a little bit depending on their chosen sport or depending on how active they are and um, just what that looks like. And obviously they can touch base with a professional and get more individualized recommendations that way. That's right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Another thing I wanted to ask you what is what does the science say? And what is your take on plant based meats and protein powders? And do you have a difference of opinion based on if someone is uh, just sort of the average adult versus maybe a, an older adult or an athlete? What what is what's your thought there? Okay, well, you asked about the veggie meats. That's a one category. Now, if we yeah. look at, at one time, I did a cooking class with ten kinds of burgers. Oh, wonderful! Kind of fun, like yeah. there's a lot out there, and if yeah. you look at the labels, you'll see that it's very diverse what they what they are made of. Some of them mm-hmm. are pretty much whole foods packaged right. into some nice little patty that is very tasty, and then we have burgers. Um, that have had a fair amount of technology to create them. Now, people think why, I've actually been asked, why would somebody make a meat-like substitute? You know? Oh, right, yeah. (laughs) But the thing is that we do not go out and bite a cow. No, we do not. It is is taken (laughs) from that and then packaged into a human-friendly form. So what we do with these veggie meats is package the plant foods into a form that, you know, you can pick up well with your hands if it's a burger with a bun type of thing, mm-hmm. or you can use to make lasagna, you know, that kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. And yeah. and so um, they're, they're very handy. And people are at different places for how they want to use them or would use them. Like they can be really handy. One that's made to be very meat like, like, um, you know, what are some of the ones that you've tried? Um, uh, the Beyond Burger Beyond or the Impossible. Burger. I think the Impossible, Impossible is the one that's a bit more meat-like bit more, and a bit more maybe right. realistic to. Yeah, like, yeah. And know, so it will actually meat. drip something like blood, but it isn't really blood. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, but sometimes that can be very appealing if you have your father-in-law over and he would not want to eat anything vegetarian. For He's sure. One there. But when he tries this burger, he'll go, huh. Well, that's not too bad. I could have that once in a while. Yeah, if you serve those when I come over, it's all right. Yeah, and exactly. Then there's some like the Beyond Burger that are, are not. Um, that one was made more for health reasons than to simulate meat very closely. So they had different objectives in the different ones. Right. And some are um, like field roast kind of thing or mm-hmm. they're are made um with different ingredients and so it's just kind of fun to look at them and i i find that people are in different places like kids sure. at school often want to have a slice of something or want to have a hot dog when everybody else is and they get their hot dog that is not a class one carcinogen yes which is bonus really good. yeah what a big plus yeah, yeah amazing yeah. so it's unfortunate that these cured meats have um gone into such disrepute now because they're linked in they're in the same category according to the cancer associations that they're they're in the same and the world health organization that they're in the same category as roundup and cigarette smoking the cured meats which um one of the last things i ate like in the 70s was bacon right really good yeah people love bacon <laughs> I, did, I did too now they're yeah. luckily they're making some veggie makings exactly. which are not class one carcinogens yeah. but it's unfortunate that these cured meats um which tasted so appealing uh they're they're not health foods by a long shot yeah for sure so that's about the 
the veggie meats, they can have a place. And mm -hmm. then some people, a lot of the clients I have want to really be more whole foodsy. And yeah, I've got to do that. Like, and my husband, actually, he, he likes really vegetables and whole foods and that that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of depends where people are in their journey. And if you like, for example, like you said, serving something where there are omnivores present and kind of getting them sort of on board a little bit, at least when they're in your household, right, to eat something plant based. And so yeah, those items do sort of serve a purpose and have a have a place. And I love your uh, party with testing them all out and little yeah, um, you know, because that's a fun, fun thing to do, fun little adventure. Um, so what about protein powder and sort of protein supplementation? What's your take on that? Well, one of the interesting thing is that there's these branch chain amino acids that help us build muscle. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, we find that the, they uh, can be quite easily reached on plant based diets, like for athletes, when they're eating lots of whole foods and they're eating soy foods um it, you can reach good levels of the branch chain amino, amino acids and particularly leucine mm -hmm. that we want for muscle building the the place but you could use the protein powders and look for one that says branch chain amino acids and it's probably from soy um could have something with pea protein um and then when you're a senior it's kind of a um, interesting story because some of the seniors lose muscle mass they get sarcopenia mm -hmm. and they're very frail and don't eat very much so I've found that you could have those protein powders for a senior that had a kind of limited diet you know put it into their smoothie or something like that because they're just not eating that much um, one of the things that I've done um, this is another little thing to show you is Ooh, to marinate. That? It's marinated tofu. Oh, nice. I and, love some marinated tofu. Yeah. <laughs> and I just have it always in the fridge. Yeah. And then I put it in the air fryer and it's marinated in a recipe in our plant powder protein book that just has in it low sodium tamari. We try the low sodium because it gets really salty otherwise. Mm -hmm. And some rice vinegar a bit of toasted sesame oil, um, some ginger, and some garlic. Oh, it just sits in there. Sounds it, so good. <laughs> it is really good. And then I'm try you just, it. Uh, scoop out the little cubes, or it could be little, um, you know, fingers, mm -hmm. and um, put them in the air fryer. And we got an air fryer by accident almost. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because well, I didn't, you know, I didn't really thought about that. Yeah. But it makes it really easy. One of the things is that you can put it in there, put your little cubes in, set it to 14 minutes or whatever, and go and do something else and forget about it. Forget you even had something going. Right. And it just does itself. And yeah. you get little cubes. And I find that as a senior myself who wants to keep my protein intake higher, these make really good little snacks that mm. you know, instead of eating something like a potato chip or right. you know, something rather useless nutritionally, you get these little protein cubes. And yeah, that's a great tip. There's also like the top picture here has the tofu fingers the same thing mm -hmm. um, but breaded a bit and so yeah it kind that of sounds great or nutritional yeast or whatever yeah. yeah speaking of seniors many people just kind of assume that as you get older your body starts to break down it's just kind of inevitable that you get more tired and you have more injuries and you develop diseases and just things kind of go downhill as you age and I love your perspective on aging in a way that is, you know, preventing disease and maintaining muscle mass. And how, how do we how do we do that? You're doing it. You're yeah, living it. How I do am we do doing it? it? Yeah, and I'm helping <laughs> other people do it, too. Yes. Yeah, they're interested in this. I, I would like to get a group of like real healthy old people around. And actually, I do um, one of the keys. We do fitness classes um, Monday Thursday and Friday from about 1130 to 1215 online oh, that nice. we started before COVID mm -hmm. and we're still doing. And I'm the host for it. I don't teach the fitness class, but our teacher that we had before COVID 
has stayed with us and we're doing these fitness classes. So that's an important thing. And we also walk around Trout Lake every morning, my husband and I. Yeah. Do other, you know, do things like yoga. So try and do um, pretty close to an hour of exercise every day, you know, including also things like gardening and carrying things around. And, and so that's one key. Then with food, following that food guide um, that we have on the plant powered protein site and, and our, our different websites. Um, the other thing is that when we are, well, I found since I was 60, things would start to go a little bit, uh, you know, I'd get a back pain thing or something. Yeah. I'd go to a physio and I could catch things mm. and have them not go very far and get them turned around. Now, when people don't do that, then it can just get worse and worse and worse. Right. Um, we can have slightly high cholesterol levels and, you know, have that move into something. I've had quite a number of clients that have pre-diabetes and are smart enough to catch it at that stage and learn how to go. People think of sugar, but it's also cutting down on the fat intake. Mm -hmm. That can make a big difference because... The belly fat that um, people develop is where the origins of disease and decay are, really. Yeah. So, so if you start catching things when you get to be kind of retirement age, um, it can really make a big difference. So I'm hoping to go to 118. Yes. Be fun. <laughs> Made a deal with my sister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so we've got about two thirds of the way there. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And I love the the sense of hope that you bring to it, too. It's not just like, oh, I'm older now, so I can just, you know, sit around and give up and like not take care of my health and not, um, you know, do something about it. I have a bit of control here. I do have a bit of power here. And I think sometimes people just don't think they have any power to make changes or to do something healthy for themselves that'll really make an impact. And I love how you're showing through your own actions what how to be, you know, a really healthy senior and really active and vibrant. And also you're helping so many people do that as well. But one other part of it is about sociability. Yes, yeah. I live in something called Vancouver Co-housing. Okay. It's East 33rd between Victoria and Knight. And we actually have an event on um, June 24th. We mm -hmm. have these meatless meetups. And oh, this cool. And snack luck. And people can come for free. Or actually, they bring a toonie usually. Yeah. But we're having my co-author, Corey Davis, speak on the environment and mm. uh, the dietary choice and its impact on climate change. And people come and bring a, a little vegan snack, just something to put in and, and people have snacks and we have a talk. Yeah. So that's on, um, it's called meatless meetup and people can, can look at that group. Some other, and, and you all co also can see what co-housing is because it's a Danish concept and we have 31 households and uh, we have a big courtyard. We had music all through COVID because we have a number of musicians here. Mm -hmm. And we also have a common house. Um, so we have meals three times a week and you pay about five bucks. We take turns being cooks and chefs. You just cook once a month and yeah. access to all these meals. And, and uh, it just brings a sense of community. You can borrow grandchildren if yours live in Nova Scotia and you live in Vancouver or something, you know, and, and you could um, help each other out. People have helped each other out when they needed to get to the hospital in the middle. Yeah. Of, you know, just all this kind of thing. So, and people have different kinds of communities, you know, faith-based or their walking group, their cycling group. It's, it's just really important to keep that going too. Yeah, absolutely. I love that co-housing concept. That sounds really, really interesting, really yeah. fascinating, like a very different way of living. But at the same time, it kind of harkens back perhaps to a previous way of living, right? That's and, right. It's yeah, a Danish building concept, community. The yeah. modern form of village. So we yeah. have a three bedroom townhouse. So one is my office here. Mm -hmm. but um, And my husband has an office and then a bedroom. But we um, have a 
a common house that has a big dining room. Mm-hmm. It has a laundry facility. So we don't have to have a washer and dryer in everybody's little house, you know. Yeah. We have a children's playroom. So when our grandchild comes to visit, he can go and play in the playroom and there's other kids there to yeah. all kinds of adventures. We have two guest rooms, um, a teen room that's way off in the corner so they can be as noisy as they want. And, <laughs> yeah. And a, a workshop, um, a business center, and a yoga wow. room. So it's that's got wonderful. all this extra stuff, and you don't have to have your house so big. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's great. Anyway, and I, I think it kind of speaks to the community aspect, and it also speaks to sort of a, an energy efficiency as well, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah Maybe, that's really great. We can post a few links. other. At the yeah, office. I would love that. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's um, important for people, whether they're in a co-housing situation or whether they have, you know, a regular fitness class they go to or, you know, a walking group or like you said, you know, faith based community, some kind of community building that they're interacting with other humans and being social in some way. Uh, very, yeah. very important for everyone. And I think um, particularly as you as we're aging as well. Yeah, yeah that's right. Sure. Oh, and the meatless meetups are good for um, dating people. Oh, right. A lot of restaurant <laughs> get togethers, um, yeah. probably two a week. Oh, like nice. all kinds of different plant based restaurants. Yeah. exploring them and you you go and there's all kinds of people there or there there are hikes through meet this meetup so yeah that's great a lot that's of really options. wonderful do you have a favorite recipe from plant-powered protein oh i think it's these um little protein cubes yeah those yeah, are those, wonderful those are good and and also this bean salad well actually i like that combination of the I, I always start off with the lettuce and the um, lemon yeah. tahini dressing because I love it so much. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that lemon tahini dressing looks good. But we we made it so that all our recipes in the Plant Power Protein and in that Kick Diabetes book were five-star recipes from our testers. And we oh, have great. testers <laughs> that were up in the Okanagan and also in San Francisco Ooh. that would would try things out and, and send back tweaks or suggestions or wanted it to be accessible ingredients, you know, they taste good, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And so we couldn't let anything through until it reached the five star category. Oh, that's great. That's really wonderful with the testing and um, having different people sort of test them out and uh, make those little switches and tweaks to really uh, make it as wonderful as possible, as delicious as possible. That's great. And all the recipes look amazing. I haven't had a chance to try any of them yet, but I'm very excited to give them a go, especially that uh, peanut edamame noodle salad looks wonderful oh, yeah. <laughs> and the gado gado looks really delicious yeah. and cookies i have a sweet tooth so i'll probably check out the cookie oh you the recipes good ones yeah <laughs> really good yeah ones. <laughs> so what's next for you Vasanto? what projects are you working on you mentioned at the beginning that you have some speaking engagements coming up um is that kind of your main focus right now or what else do you have on the go well i'm doing lots of um interviews actually i just yeah. had uh, Rip Esselstein here yesterday. Nice. He's, he's a, a guy who, son of Caldwell Esselstein. Of course, yeah. And uh, he got his whole fire hall to go plant based, um, mm-hmm. which was pretty amazing for a fireman to get his whole Absolutely, fire hall yeah. in Texas to go <laughs> plant based. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, then um, I'll be speaking in Chilliwack on Saturday at a little vegan festival. I'm amazed that these things are popping up all over, maybe yeah. in Nanaimo at the end of July and probably Great. in Victoria. But then in the fall, I'll speak in um, Philadelphia at the Vegan Society's headquarters and then in New York because the New York school system is interested. Mm-hmm. They have a, a vegan mayor in New York and right. uh, the whole uh, state of New York has had little uh, veggie clips in the morning at the schools Hmm. wake up wellness messages that one of the kids would read that and they weren't you know telling people they had to be vegan but they were kind of oriented towards health and plants and that kind of thing and then I'll be speaking in at something called Peapod which is to health professionals in Hmm. Jersey and then later in Brazil 
Oh, that's great. Wow. You have a lot on the go. You're very busy. (laughs) Yeah, lots of fun. And it's so heartwarming, you know, that there are people in all these different areas that are working in different ways. Maybe it's just helping your mother, Mm -hmm. you know, get more healthy. Or maybe it's um, getting your kids to eat healthy foods. Or maybe it's, um, you know, getting um, people in a nursing home to have some options. You know, they're just people working all these different ways. Yeah, Um, it's really wonderful to see all the everyone coming together as kind of like a team to connect and to um, create Uh, a space where we can make plant-based living easier for people and help people out in different ways with our own expertise and our own are in our own ways. So yeah, it's really wonderful. How can people connect with you? How can they kind of learn more and connect with you? You mentioned your website, NutriSpeak. Uh, Where else can people find you? Oh, my email is my name, which is thesanto.melina, M-E-L-I-N-A, at gmail.com so that's email. Mm-hmm. and you also have social media correct social media You're on yeah. instagram <laughs> getting better at doing instagram yeah. <laughs> yeah. i follow you i noticed that <laughs> oh thank you yeah yeah I'll leave all those links. That's wonderful. I'll leave all of those links in the description box below. So everyone can go check out your website and they can email you if they want to. They can reach out through social media. Go follow Vasanto on Instagram, guys. She's getting into a rhythm of posting more and that's really fun. Um, Check out Plant Powered Protein. I'll have a link below, but also check out, you know, your library or your local bookshop in your area. That's always a good way to find it as well. Um, Most is, of our books are in the public Vancouver Public Library. That's great. But, that's um, the plant powered one, I don't think is in. Might there. not be yet because people it's brand can new. write in and say, "Please get it." So yeah, they do that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. a good good way to do it for sure. Yeah. So I'll have all those links below. Uh, so that you can further connect with Visanto. Leave any questions in the comment section below as well. I will do my best to answer them. And if not, then I will refer refer you to someone else who might know the answer. (laughs) Meg, thank you very much for what you're doing. Oh, thank you. appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. It's good. You look so gorgeous and glowing. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. (laughs) I I do my best. I've lost 80 pounds and now I'm kind of on a mission to help other people sort of lose weight, get healthy, get into plant-based eating and just live a healthier lifestyle and bring some joy into it and bring some simplicity and fun to it as well. Wow. What a good, good um, path to follow. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for meeting with me and having this conversation, Visanto. It was a lot of fun. I, I was thrilled to meet you at Planted Expo and get my book signed. That was great. <laughs> Got the book signed by Visanto, Corey, and Brenda as well. Um, so it was a pleasure to meet you there and also to chat with you today and uh, to share you and your work with my audience. I'm sure that they will love this and will connect with you further. For my viewers, thank you so much for watching and for being here. And I hope everyone's having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye. Bye.